So I know a lot of you on this call, hi. And for those of you that, that don't know me, uh, my interest in manufacturing goes way back. I grew up in a manufacturing family. I'm fifth generation. Um, own, the, own the, the manufacturing company. It's a packaging company in Wisconsin for about 175 years. And so I, I understand manufacturing. It's in my DNA and have, have been, was very interested to learn, which I didn't know, that manufacturing had a rich history in Connecticut. And when I joined SVP about six years ago, I made it my mission to understand manufacturing in Connecticut and in particular career pathways into manufacturing. And um, I, as I thought about this, this panel, I know a lot of us at SVP are looking at career pathways for underserved populations, for students coming out of high school who, can't, who don't want to go to college, where do they go? And so I thought it would be interesting to look at manufacturing from different perspectives, um, from the perspective of an employer, from the perspective of uh, a, a person who's involved in, in high schools and education and de yeah, developing career pathways, and from the, the perspective of our chief manufacturing officer. So I am really excited to introduce um, our three panelists. The first is Marty Gway, and he's the vice president and business of business development at uh, Stanley Black and Decker. And in this capacity, Marty creates business value opportunities by working with startups, academia, venture capital, and global corporations. Forgive my reading of this. He has worked with innovation communities, universities, incubators, accelerators across the world. And currently he's working on workforce development, economic development and advanced manufacturing strategies in Connecticut and the United States. Then uh, Marty will be followed by uh, <clears throat> Shannon Marimon, who is uh, who runs Ready CT, and which is a statewide nonprofit that sits at the intersection of K-12 education and workforce development. Before stepping into her role at Ready CT, Shannon was director of talent and operations for the Connecticut Rise Network, focused on student college career and career readiness. And prior to Rye, Shannon was the division director for education effectiveness at the Connecticut State Department of Education. And then rounding out our group, we have uh, Paul Lavoy, who just, I think three months ago, took on the role of um, chief manufacturing officer for the state of Connecticut. And um, it, which is a position created to coordinate efforts from the state and private sector to expand manufacturing in Connecticut. And that, is an incredibly exciting, it's exciting for the manufacturing sector that we have somebody in that role at the state level. Paul has extensive industry experience, most recently as the general manager at Cary Manufacturing in Cromwell, Connecticut. And Cary is known for their reshoring efforts, bringing jobs back from China to Connecticut. And prior to Cary, Paul was vice president of sales, marketing, and human resources at Edder Engineering Company in Brist Bristol. So we have a, a, a great panel and I'm really excited to get going. Marty's gonna start, I thought it would be fun um, for Marty to talk about uh, manufacturing or, or industry 4.0 because Stanley Black and Deckers has their manufactory where they're really um, exploring that in particular and possibly ways to get more of that into, into Connecticut and manufacturing in Connecticut. So Marty, you wanna kick it off for us? Sure. Thanks, Sylvia. And thanks for having, uh, having me here. Um, I'm with Stanley Black and Decker, and many of you know us as a, a, a old, almost 180-year-old uh, American manufacturing company. We're, we're predominantly a tools business. You know us from our brands of DeWalt, Craftsman, Bostitch, Porter Cable, Irwin Lennox, a real house of brands. Uh, but we also have an industrial division where we uh, build fasteners. Um, just for the automotive industry, about 90% of the cars on the road today have Stanley content inside of them. We make fasteners to hold Tesla batteries into Tesla cars and uh, all kinds of things. And we also have an outdoor business, which has grown rapidly in the last year uh, because we've done a few big acquisitions. So you'll see us uh, in a bigger way in the lawn and the, the outdoor business. Um, 
And we're excited about that because one of the strategies we have is the electrification through batteries of the whole outdoor market. Uh, so we're, we're, we're thrilled as a $20 billion company. We, we think that we're, uh, we're not good because we're big. We're big because we're good. We've got 50, 55,000 people working hard every day on this. Uh, but we're, we're, we're a company for the makers because as the biggest tool maker in the world, we are for the makers who, who have to build, build things. So we've got really two, what I call two uh, things that are important for today's discussion. One is to manufacture our goods through 140 plants around the world, uh, but those goods make things. So we are, um, we are the largest tool maker in the world. So by proxy, our tools make the world, but we need makers. So as we're transforming our operations through industry 4.0, uh, which we are, um, we know that the journey of, of digitization of manufacturing is important. Uh, and simply put, the reason why industry 4.0 is important for manufacturing is to unleash trapped productivity. There's a lot of things that happen in manufacturing today that are unproductive or they don't, uh, they, they, they add cost but not value. So if you can create speed, you can automate things. If pick, people are picking and placing things from the manufacturing line into a box, th there's no added value there. And candidly, we can't find the people to do those jobs. So we've got compression on finding people to do the job and we, we, we need to unleash more productivity inside of our operations. So how, how do we do all that? That's, that's really uh, both ends of the candle uh, burning. Uh, we know that's really done through workforce development. So our CEO, Jim Lurie sits on the governor's workforce council. I'm his proxy for that. So we work hard on regional sector partnerships. Manufacturing is really uh, a strong area of focus and probably Connecticut's most sophisticated uh, industry. Uh, we have the highest paid manufacturing jobs in the country. Uh, we make, as everyone knows, pretty visible um, uh, moments like uh, nuclear subs and helicopters and jet engines. But there's three and a half, four thousand 4,000 companies out there making all kinds of things. So we're excited about that. 15% of our state's GDP is manufacturing. So we really need to, to move the sector towards higher productivity because if we can create more value, less cost, better quality, we can get more business. Uh, and we need to bring more people into the trades. And that's part of uh, one of the things that we're working on at Stanley Black & Decker. Today, uh, as we look at makers out there, so again, we're, we're transforming our factories, but people going into factories are similar to people making buildings, construction sites, makers all over the world. Today, there is a shortage of skilled trade workers around the world. In, in, in the world today, there's 10 million open manufacturing jobs. 650,000 uh, are in the US. Um, and what we've done at Stanley Black & Decker to try and alleviate that shortage is we have launched a global impact challenge which is a five-year, $25 million commitment to help fund vocational skills uh, around training programs, again, in manufacturing and in construction, because we are, our purpose is we are uh, for those who make the world, uh, and really we need those craftsmen. Um, so those, those um, that challenge went out, the first cohort, there was 86 recipients, uh, out of 240 applications, this was global in US, Canada, England, Mexico, uh, Uganda, uh, $3 million were, were awarded and a million dollars in tool donations. Uh, we expect to, um, to train 180,000 people through those programs and we're supporting nonprofits uh, in introducing minorities into trade. So. Of the recipients, 29 organizations supported veterans, 25 supported displaced workers, 56 organizations supported people of color, 
56 also supported under-resourced communities. Uh, we had uh, a, a, as large of a group supporting women and two organizations supporting the LGBTQ plus community. So for us, um, we really want to open the aperture and bring more people into uh, manufacturing and construction. Uh, we also embarked on a maker's index to find out really what was going on. And I think Paul and Shannon who follow me will be more fluent uh, in this moment, but I will share with you what we learned uh, through our maker's index. And we spoke to high schoolers, parents and professionals to learn about their perceptions of trade careers. 85% of young people and 94% of parents think that skilled trade work is a good career. So that's really the good news. Um, but the not so good news that we have to work on is less than half of the youth say that they would consider a skilled trade and far fewer are very likely to consider a career in that 16%. Um, and we're, so we're missing out on a big cohort. And the key drivers for the, the, the gap here is a misunderstanding of the long-term financial security of this industry, incorrect knowledge of the required skills, lack of exposure uh, to those trade skills area, and an observation that, that the trades are a male-dominated uh, industry. So for us, it's really opening up the aperture, bringing more people in, um, these jobs inside of manufacturing are high tech jobs. They're not dull, dirty and dangerous anymore. Uh, as you go to industry 4.0, uh, these are high tech jobs. And I would, I would the, the, the analog I would point you to is uh, people who work in hospitals years ago would provide manual care. Today they're providing diagnostics, testing, evaluation, uh, data interpretation. So hospitals have become very high tech in their moment. You certainly still need manual care, but it really has a lot of technology in there. And that's really what's happening with manufacturing. Uh, we also believe that we need to um, focus on careers that are uh, skills-based. And I think Synchrony and Margaret Keene have taken a great step in this area through their digital academy and what they've done in Stanford around skills-based hiring. 50% of the jobs that they posted at Synchrony two years ago required a bachelor's degree. Today, that number is 10%. So they're really allowing people to come into good full-time high paying jobs that may not otherwise have been there. And the other thing that we're working on, and this is a longer uh, putt and a longer process is second chance hiring. We think manufacturing, uh, and construction is a, is a really good way to bring uh, people with blemish records uh, and give them a good second chance to come into the trades. Uh, they're not typically customer facing or they're not typically, there's a lot of concern out there for, you know, uh, for people that would have access to data or customers, but manufacturing is a perfect place. And what we realize is that people who make things uh, whether it's in manufacturing or with tools, feel better about themselves. So self-worth goes up and, and we think uh, this is an important moment. In the city of Hartford, and the city of Hartford does not look dissimilar to other cities in Connecticut, 10% of the people have blemish records. Uh, so if we don't figure out ways to get the, these cohorts into the mainstream, or into good full-time paying jobs with benefits, we're really missing out on what I call a trapped labor pool. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Sylvia. Um, and thanks again, look forward to the discussion. I think you're on mute, Sylvia. Sorry about that. Um, can you just say a little bit about your manufactory? I just, I just find that really interesting. That's, you yeah. know, in terms of what, of the kind of the factory of the future. Yeah. What we have in Hartford is a, what we, it's a center of excellence called Manufactory 4.0. Our company was founded in 1843 and the original name was the Stanley Bolt Manufactory. So we took the name and played it forward. 
Uh, but really it's to have a, a center of competence and a center of knowledge. So we could bring people in from around the world and have people work there on enabling cell automation, uh, robots deployment, cobot deployment, um, data analytics, um, all industrial IoT. So it's really a, a center of excellence. We put it, it, we could have put it anywhere in the world, but our CEO wanted to put it in Hartford as a commitment to the city. Uh, and we're using that as with many of our other resources in Connecticut to establish advanced manufacturing leadership uh, in the state uh, to compete against the rest of the country and the world. Manufacturing is important. Uh, what everyone's seen the last two years, the world globalization is decaying, regionalization is accelerating. People want supply chains to be closer to the point of impact, so that's happening. And the green impact of shipping goods around the world where they uh, can be made more local uh, is going to be an important metric for people to understand. Great, thanks. It's wonderful that Stanley Black and Decker has made that kind of commitment to Connecticut. And hopefully that manufactory, you're trying to get young people to come in there and see what's what's available, you know, in manufacturing us. So that it's a very different world. Yeah, we do. We inspire young people, not enough of them, but I think the parents are part of the problem with the grandparents. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's a good time to turn to Shannon. Okay. You want to talk about the students? Sure thing. Um, so, well, thank you, um, Sylvia and, and SVP for the invitation. I am very excited to have this conversation and uh, love, you know, hearing Marty speak every single time and, and I'm getting to know Paul more. And I think there's a really great uh, a set of resources becoming available. Uh, have always been there, I think, in Connecticut. They're really coaling in a in a great way. Um, and speaking of the manufactory, we are supposed to have an event next Wednesday with students from Hartford Public Schools, um, specifically students who are expected to graduate with their high school diplomas in less than a month, but do not have a post-secondary plan. So we will be um, bringing them all to the manufactory, getting them excited. Uh, we are running into, I will admit, some, some uh, roadblocks with um, field trip permission slips, but we're getting getting around that barrier. Um, but the realities of working in the K-12 system and with minors, uh, we are not for the faint of heart. So, um, but with that, I do have a PowerPoint I was going to share and go through pretty quickly and then um, definitely want to open it up to questions. So I will share my screen. Can everybody see that? Great. Um, so just really quickly, um, Sylvia described uh, Ready CT a, a bit, but we are a statewide nonprofit. We, we do work really closely with the educational system, the K-12 education system in particular, and we're looking to better align the education system with the world of work and ensuring that when we say that we want students to be college and career ready, that we are making true on the second part of that phrase. Um, there's been a lot of effort in the K-12 system and even the accountability metrics that are used to measure our K-12 system are very heavy on the college uh, going culture and prep preparation and, and um, enrollment, but we want to make sure that it's a both and, that students are getting that exposure uh, early and often to different career opportunities so that they, that will then drive and, and inform the decisions they're making around continued education and training. Um, we are statewide. We do work both in the um, policy space as well as the direct programming area, which is where I'll be focused today. Um, but I think that it's important to talk about the policy work because we're always thinking about the systems level changes that are needed in order to enable the good programming that we're trying to do or others are trying to do. Um, there are some barriers um, just in terms of the bureaucracy of the K-12 system that we're always looking at ways to address. Um, and then there's things we want to um, uh, incentivize and create incentives through policy to, to drive more uh, opportunity and access for students. So we work at that that intersection um, with, with policy and programming, which I think are very reinforcing of the other. Um, a key partnership in our work, we are a, an affiliate of uh, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, CBIA, which um, has about 6,000 uh, members across the state of Connecticut. 
and uh, business members who we ultimately uh, access and, and, and connect with in order to bring those opportunities to students and educators in the K-12 system. Um, it's a really great uh, affiliation. We're actually strengthening it, I would say, by the day. And um, for those who don't know, Christy Pentima, who's the president and CEO of CBIA, is from the manufacturing world himself. And so he is the first a leader of CBIA who comes from industry. Uh, all former um, prior leaders were individuals who kind of worked their way up through the organization more on the policy side of the house. And so having that perspective of um, having worked in the field and being a, a practitioner and specifically in manufacturing, Chris brings a passion that is very authentic. Um, he also is the father of three children who went through the um, through the public school system. So just a commitment that is is really exciting and, and we're seeing opportunity to build our partnership more and more every day. So our career pathway work, which is where I'm going to focus, because Sylvia it was, you know, kind of raised, brought that up. I'm going to talk about one other initiative too that we're doing. But the career pathway work we're doing is probably the biggest part of our portfolio at this point. Um, a lot of interest in the state of Connecticut in terms of providing these career paths embedded within the comprehensive um, high schools. Uh, we start even in the middle school, so kind of this middle school, high school connection to getting students excited about particular career themed paths. And this slide just summarizes all, all the current pathways that we're current that we're supporting. Um, we are very focused in the in the Hartford area geographically because that's where we started. I'll, I'll go back to our origin story just a little bit with our first pathway. Um, so it's kind of rippled out from there. So we went from Hartford and we're supporting all the career theme pathways in Hartford Public Schools, expanded to New Britain, and then most recently East Hartford and Bristol. We are having conversations with districts in other parts of the state, but we really wanted to perfect kind of the technical assistance model that we use before we expanded too far. Um, we actually are also working with SVP and have an SVP, SVP team that includes Sylvia um, to help us define our strategic plan for that growth. So lots of work underway in this area. But as you can see, um, manufacturing is a, is a pathway in all four of the districts we're currently working. So it's, it's one that is very much on the forefront of our mind when we're thinking about our program design uh, and implementation. So when we think about a high quality career pathway, um, there's basically four elements that we focus on. They are loosely framed around a national model called the, the NAF model, but we work with just, we're kind of agnostic to the model. We, we work with districts that use a certain framework and we use work with districts that, that don't, but we try to implement these same practices wherever we go. Um, one is the this idea of a school within a school model. So the pathway is an opportunity and an option for students within their traditional comprehensive high school, they may choose that path or they may go more of a general education route. And um, there's flexibility to kind of on ramps and off ramps into that pathway. Um, we're very interested in an industry informed curriculum. So having industry partners look at the curriculum and the coursework that students are taking to make sure that it's relevant and rigorous and connected to the world of work. Um, we also look at opportunities to embed industry recognized credentials and dual enrollment opportunities to give students a leg up as they're advancing their education. Um, a third major component is the industry advisory board. Every pathway we support has a dedicated industry advisory board that is composed of 80% representatives of that industry. And um, they become the champions and the cheerleaders of the pathway uh, at the school and out in the world. And it's we meet monthly. They're very um, thoughtfully uh, planned, all the meetings that we have. And we have subcommittee work that happens in between the full meetings. So this is a very active working uh, effort. It's, it's not a passive board in any way. Um, and last but not least, where I think Ready CT offers the greatest value is around work-based learning and this continuum of thinking, you know, starting in the earliest grade levels, ideally we could be talking to families and grandparents and, and parents in the um, elementary stage, but definitely by middle school, we're introducing students and families to the pathway opportunities. And then by high school, they're going through a series of work-based learning uh, opportunities all along the way that build on each other in, in sequence. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. Um, so where it all started, our first pathway was is an engineering and green technology pathway at Harper Public High School. It was established in 2008. Um, we um, 
uh, do use the NAF model at this particular pathway. Um, that is the, the request of the, of the school district and the partners have, have selected that as the, as the model that they're using, which includes all those elements I just referenced. Um, and it, we call it powered by Raytheon. So when, a, when there's an employer kind of sponsor of a pathway, we consider that pathway to be powered by that employer or a group of employers. So in this particular case, it's Raytheon Technologies and they have supported this pathway going back to when they were United Technologies um, to 2008. Um, so it's really one of the most stable uh, forces that's existed in this school. This is a school that in the last 10 years has had eight different principals. Um, we have had the school go from a, a, a academy structure of three different academies to a consolidated structure, just a lot of turnover, a lot of change. But the one thing that's actually stayed constant has been this particular pathway and the industry advisory board that supports it, of which um, the membership, we have uh, 16 members now, um, seven of them are original founding board members going back to 2008. So that stability and consistency is really, really key. Um, we do a lot of messaging and we've done a messaging throughout um, in this pathway around the idea that there's a lot of paths to success, a lot of opportunities for students, whether they're choosing to go on to a two or four year degree or direct into career or onto a credential. Um, we emphasize the hands-on nature. I loved what Marty said about that fulfillment of being able to use, work with your hands and see the fruits of what you're able to create and make. And that has been really meaningful for a lot of the students who maybe didn't know what they could be good at until they had access to this, this opportunity. Um, and then we do a lot of things that integrate that work-based learning that I talked about. So tours, job shadowing, um, guest speakers, and then uh, internships are a big focus of what we do. And Abigail Whitmore um, is one of the students who, who was, you know, has been in our program. She's amazing. She comes back and speaks as an alumna. Now she is a junior at UConn doing a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, and she, she has had tons of different experiences, including working with Otis and Pratt and & Whitney. Um, I was pleased to hear Marty mention um, the, the need to address uh, uh, female students and engaging uh, females into the, into the profession. This is something we focus on a lot. Um, specifically uh, in uh, the engineering and green technology pathway, we've had a really concerted effort this past year to increase the enrollment of students in the pathway, uh, female students in the pathway. Um, we know that there is a, a challenge that only 29% of science and engineering jobs are held by women. Um, and la this current year, it, a lot of changes happened during COVID and we had some you know, attrition for um, all sorts of reasons, but only two of the 60 sophomore students enrolled in this pathway were female. Um, and so we knew this was a real challenge. Um, our program manager who is embedded at the school implementing this pathway day in and day out really emphasize, worked with a group of ambassadors from the school, student ambassadors, and then really focused on the ninth graders to get them excited about the pathway, tell them about all the opportunities. Um, we did a full STEM ahead uh, after school program, a signing week where there was a lot of excitement around the pathway uh, and opportunities. And then we have a bridge program in the summer for students that are ninth graders thinking about which pathway they're gonna choose for 10th grade. And they get a really great deep dive into both the engineering pathway and the allied health pathway, which is the other option at that school. And then we also created an all female intro to engineering course. And at the end of um, the signing week, which was about a month ago, uh, the students had to indicate which pathway they were gonna select for next year as ninth graders going into 10th grade. And that we increased it to, to 25 of the 83 going in as sophomores will be female students. So up 3% to 30%. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to do more of across all the pathways that we support. Um, this is just our continuum of work-based learning. I won't go to, into this in much detail, but we really think about work-based learning as multimodal and lots of different opportunities to come in and out of the profession and the experience. It's not just the internship. In fact, we want there to be a scaffolded, scaffolding of experiences that lead to the internship so that the student can be set up for success when he or she gets into that internship opportunity. Um, we do a lot of mock interviewing. I'm going to go through these fast. We do student-led enterprises where students are getting to actually do entrepreneurial efforts and build and use uh, their hands to create prototypes and then present them in a business plan format. 
Um, we do first ro robotics partnerships. Um, we're trying to build that out. So every manufacturing pathway and other STEM related pathways also have a connection to first robotics. Um, the Birds of Prey, which is one of the original robotics teams is based in Hartford and they are phenomenal. Again, during COVID, they kind of lagged a little bit, but now they're coming back full speed. Um, and so they've had some, some winning uh, history and they want to get that back again. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly exciting to see the students uh, engage in, in these kinds of activities. Service learning that's um, in the top uh, middle photo is Greg Hayes, the CEO of Raytheon, came to Hartford to do a project that actually um, had the students building a uh, hydro-powered um, uh, system to, to feed a community garden uh, and, and, and water it and keep it powered and uh, came in with the um, Engineers Beyond Borders group that is also local at Pratt & Whitney uh, to work with the students. And then dual enrollment, we do a lot of partnership with higher ed to bring uh, opportunity to students in the classroom so that they can start earning credits for either uh, a credential or, or a degree. Um, this particular program, eCamp, actually at the end of senior year, we have students graduate each year with 21 credits uh, of manufacturing that um, can be applied towards a two-year certificate program. So they just need to, to do another six months to finish all their credits. And then they will have that certificate in order to go directly into a career opportunity. And we have a full curriculum that we do with our students. Our, our team, our program team really is focused on delivering this curriculum consistently so that students get the employability skills that they need to be successful out in the workforce and in the work site. Um, and, and then just also get build the confidence and the excitement for what's to come. And um, while career uh, work-based based learning opportunities will take different forms, we do have a culminating expectation that every student in our career pathways will complete a 120 hour paid internship. Um, so we last summer we had uh, 268 students complete internships through our program and this summer we're on track to double that. Um, so we're just continually as we expand our pathways we're also expanding the internship opportunities. And then um, we do a lot of statewide programming that supports our work generally. Uh, I just wanted to really quickly touch on the manufacturing skills for Connecticut projects since it is specific to manufacturing. Um, this is a two-year project. It was an award given to the um, to CONSTEP, our state's manufacturing extension partnership, uh, by the U.S. Department of Commerce. And the, the proposal actually came out of the state's Connecticut um, uh, manufacturers Collaborative, which is a group of manufacturing uh, associations from across the state that meet monthly and talk about the needs of um, the manufacturing workforce and other aspects of manufacturing. And so um, they said we needed to study the K-12 system more and better understand what programs are out there re relative to preparing students for careers in manufacturing. So this is a, um, like I said, a two-year project three phases. First phase was inventorying every program in the state that claims to be doing anything to prepare students for careers in manufacturing. There were 142 of them that claimed that to be the case. Um, we surveyed them, gathered information on them, and then selected 12 of them in phase two to do a deep analysis of the actual quality of that program and the student outcomes. And phase three is to actually report out on those findings and to share a website, which is going to, um, it's actually being previewed at one o'clock today with the CMC, the Connecticut Manufacturers Collaborative for some feedback. Um, but this is gonna be the, the kind of one-stop shop for information for employers, school partners, families, students um, to uh, uh, understand, to know the lay of the land relative to K-12 manufacturing programming. Um, with, with some analysis on, on best practices. So that should go live after some feedback from, from stakeholders uh, within the next month or two. And then last but not least, we are doing a, comp a complementary project with the, the full research study of all the pathway programs out there. We are doing a transfer VR pilot. This is a using the Oculus uh, virtual reality headsets 
we acquired five of them um, through a grant and they've been um, traveling the state to different school districts for, for educators to try them out with students and um, collecting data along the way on that usage and kind of the feedback from the students on how effective the uh, content has been. There are two modules. One is focused on general career exploration and manufacturing, and one is focused on manufacturing fundamentals and gets much more technical. Um, but we've had uh, uh, hundreds of students at this point access the headsets, and then that data is being collected so that we can better understand you know, what was working, what didn't work, how would we integrate this into coursework and opportunities going forward. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over back over to Sylvia and then look forward to the discussion. That's awesome, Shannon. Um, you know, I, I look at what you do and hear about what you do and I wonder why is it only in the Hartford area? And so I was just wondering, you know, how, what about your efforts to reach beyond Hartford and, and offer what, what you're doing in, in Hartford to the rest of the state? Can you talk a little, a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, the only constraint to that is just our ability to, to grow. I mean, like I said earlier, we have interest from other districts. I think where we're most likely to go next would be New Haven. Um, we've got an, an active kind of discussion happening with them, and they are standing up a new manufacturing pathway, uh, actually do uh, as a result of Rosa DeLauro's advocacy. Um, and then we are crossing our fingers on a grant opportunity in the eastern part of the state to work with the EWIB, uh, the Eastern Workforce Investment Board, in expanding the Youth Manufacturing Pipeline Initiative, which is a whole kind of related effort to what we do around getting the manufacturing pathways built into the schools there. So the expansion is, it, the opportunity is there. We just have to align it with the resources and then obviously with our own staffing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. God, that sounds great. Um, okay, Paul, now I'm going to turn it over to you and maybe you can you can start by by talking about how can you support Shannon and her efforts to to move this, you know, to, to expand around the state, but also to, to provide just a general overview of, you know, Marty gave us a bit of an overview of manufacturing in Connecticut, but maybe you could take it a, a next step further and kind of what you've discovered as you've been traveling around since you assume the your role sure so let me share my screen uh, so i'm going to do this can i do there we go so good afternoon everybody my name is paul lavoy i am the chief manufacturing officer for the state of connecticut uh, and as Chief Manufacturing Officer, it's my job to coordinate the public and private efforts that we have towards growing manufacturing. So I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of manufacturing in the state of Connecticut. I'm going to share with you some, uh, some numbers that you may or may not know uh, about manufacturing. Then I'll talk about some strategic initiatives and how they tie into what Marty talked about and even what Shannon talked about as we continue to look at how we're going to continue to grow manufacturing in the state of Connecticut. So I'm born and raised in Connecticut. The only, longest time I've been out of the state of Connecticut is for a two-week vacation. So let me give you an idea of how much of a homer I am here and, uh, and, and how much I love Connecticut. And one of the things that I've recognized about Connecticut in my, uh, in my lifetime here is that you know, Connecticut is not a half, glass half full or glass half empty state. Connecticut's still looking for the glass in that we're always you know, kind of negative on ourselves and there's been a lot of negative press. Well, as your chief manufacturing officer, I'm here to talk to you about all the good stuff that's going on because there is a ton of good stuff that's happening in Connecticut in our state of manufacturing. So you probably didn't know that we are number three in the country uh, for concentrated manufacturing areas. We are number four for productivity of US employees and we are number four for innovation as well here in the state of Connecticut. So some things that you may or may not know about our economy here in Connecticut. Uh, and to that end, we are the leaders in early precision, uh, early leaders in precision manufacturing. We have been around since the beginning of the industrial revolution. Some things that were invented here in Connecticut, Marty mentioned the nuclear submarines and helicopters were invented in Connecticut. The sewing machine was invented in Connecticut. Typewriters were invented in Connecticut. If you like to have fun, wiffle ball was invented in Connecticut and still made in Shelton, Connecticut. The Frisbee was in invented on the Yale campus uh, using some pie trays. So the Frisbee was invented here in Connecticut. In addition, we even invented the hamburger. 
So if you go to Louis' lunch in New Haven, you'll see that we invented the hamburger. And I didn't, we didn't invent this one, but I think we perfected it, and that's pizza. So I, I always kind of throw that one in there. So, um, but we are home to global manufacturing leaders, uh, and we have a very robust supply chain. Uh, and then, as you know, as Sylvia said, she's a fifth generation manufacturing in Connecticut. We have deep, deep generations of manufacturing history here in the state of Connecticut. So talk to you a little bit about the landscape in manufacturing. So we have about 4,000 advanced manufacturers here in the state of Connecticut. We employ 160,000 people, which if you do the math on that, that's about 40 people in the manufacturing business. But 40% of those people work for the top 25 companies. 60% work for companies that average less than 25 people. So the manufacturing landscape in Connecticut is there are a few large companies at the top of the, of the pyramid, if you will, and then there's a huge base of manufacturers, 3,975 that employ 100,000 people. So it's very, very small, very more family oriented, very supply chain oriented uh, landscape here in Connecticut. And as Marty mentioned, you know, manufacturing is a key driver of, of uh, the economy here in Connecticut. And the, there's 80% of the products that are made, uh, excuse me, 80% of the manufacturers in Connecticut make 100% of their products here. So, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, making parts, we don't have manufacturers with that here that are making parts all around the country. Again, a large percentage of them are making the parts right here in Connecticut. And Marty talked a lot about productivity and how industry 4.0 will help drive productivity. And because Connecticut is not a low cost state, we're a high cost state, uh, that tends to drive high productivity rates. And so Connecticut in the manufacturing sector, manufacturers are continually innovating and manufacturers are continually driving costs out of the business. So if our state were a country, Connecticut would be the sixth most productive country in the world. And that's better than Canada, the United Kingdom and Germany, just to name a few. So we have a very high skilled workforce and a very highly productive workforce here in Connecticut. And manufacturing stimulates the economy. For every manufacturing job, we create three to four jobs in other sectors of the economy. And for every dollar that we spend, we generate $2.79 of economic activity. And that's really the reason the driver behind why the governor and the legislature have put such a focus on manufacturing here in the state of Connecticut, is to really understand that manufacturing jobs are jobs that are going to grow the economy here in Connecticut and are going to help people have career changing and life changing opportunities in the manufacturing sector. So I quickly want to go through with you the strategic objectives that I have for manufacturing in Connecticut. First and foremost is that we need to create a robust workforce pipeline. And we've all talked about this and you know we're, we're thrilled to have Shannon working in the K-12 market space. You know, one of the great things about my job is that I get to learn. So I learn every day about the capabilities and capacity of manufacturing. And I always tell manufacturers uh, when I speak to them is that we need to look at 100% of the workforce when we're trying to solve our workforce problem. Marty talked about the number of jobs that are open in manufacturing. If you just look at it, and that number, he said 650,000 nationally, that number translates to about 15,000 jobs here. Uh, in Connecticut. But if you look at the Connecticut landscape, we have 117,000 open jobs and we have 89,000 people on unemployment. So even if we took everybody off of unemployment and put them into a job, we still have to bring lots of people back into the workforce and lots of people into Connecticut just to be able to fill the jobs that we have here in Connecticut. So making sure that we have people working on a robust workforce pipeline is important. We have the Office of Workforce Strategy Dr. Kelly Valeras, we have $70 million going into her office to work on just workforce development so that we continue to grow the workforce across all sectors. And I'm especially interested in having certainly laser focus on the manufacturing sector and making sure that we're building a robust workforce. We need a healthy manufacturing ecosystem. That's why we're proud to have people like Stanley Black & Decker that have centers of excellence around Industry 4.0 so I can bring manufacturers into the center of excellence to be able to show them how they can adopt technology and adapt technology to be able to grow their businesses and to be able to remain healthy and be able to remain productive. Uh, we need to, to encourage a culture of innovation. Um, the president just announced on Friday, this new initiative, a national initiative called AM Forward, which is additive manufacturing forward. Companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin are participating in these programs where it's 3D printing and they're gonna look at 3D printing parts and talking to the president of Pratt & Whitney, they, he says that aerospace the majority of parts in the next 30 years will be made through additive manufacturing in the aerospace 
um, market. So that's transformative here in Connecticut. That will certainly, last night I did a, a presentation with 100 small manufacturers. I asked them, how many of you are ready for uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing in the manufacturing supply chain? One raised their hand. So that'll give you an opportunity of what we have. And by the way, we're never going to solve our workforce problems with people, right? Where there's just not enough people and the life cycle on, on making people is 20 years. So we're not going to make them quick enough. And we're, you know, we're going to have to take innovation and automation to help drive productivity and to be able to meet our workforce goals. My job is also to make sure that we have open communication channels to all of our uh, all of our manufacturers and to coordinate the resources here in the state of Connecticut, really to break down the silos and make sure that everybody is is really working together to make sure that we're solving our problems uh, and, and really capitalizing, I would say more capitalizing on our opportunities in the manufacturing ecosystem and the manufacturing structure. How am I doing that through the Manufacturing Innovation Fund? I'll go through these quickly, but we have a voucher program, which is a grant program for equipment. We have incumbent worker training, apprenticeship programs, internship programs. We're working on digital readiness and cybersecurity assessments. And this is all money that's been set aside by the Manufacturing Innovation Fund Board to, to invest in manufacturing in the state of Connecticut. So if you wanted to do, for example, incumbent worker training, we'll help pay for that. If you wanted to do an apprenticeship program, we'll pay for those apprentices. Hearts and Mind Advertising, this is, um, is really important to Shannon, I know to Marty, and I think to everybody else. This is where we need to change the perception of manufacturing as being dark, dirty, and dangerous to being lean, clean, mean, uh, and really a advanced manufacturing being really a job and a career that you want to uh, that you want to be able to do, uh, explore. And we're doing that with parents. We're doing that with students. We're doing that with guidance counselors. We're doing that with other people in the education system. We do that through our community colleges and through our four-year institutions as well. So we're trying to get people from um, middle school all the way up to, uh, you know, listen, if you're, if you're 60 years old and you want to work in manufacturing because you always thought it would be really cool, um, we'll, we'll take you. We'll, uh, we'll reskill you. Uh, as well. We're looking at a, a comprehensive manufacturing website. We have Connecticut Innovators, which is going to be, if it's invented here, I want it manufactured here. So um, we're going to take a look at, at how we're going to be able to support that. And then regional career fairs, uh, one of the things that the internship program will do and that uh, regional career fairs were that if you learn in Connecticut, I want you to earn in Connecticut. So if you're going to school in Connecticut, I want you to make sure you get a job in Connecticut. We need to stop students from leaving the state to get other jobs because there are great jobs here uh, in the manufacturing sector. And so what have we done? So with the Manufacturing Innovation Fund, we have, um, we have uh, trained over 27,000 employees since 2015, and we have created, um, over almost 19,000 jobs here in the state of Connecticut through the Manufacturing Innovation Fund. And we know that these jobs have three characteristics. We pay high wages in manufacturing. So these are life-changing jobs. Last night at the small manufacturer's dinner, they did the uh, outstanding students at four different technical schools. And one of the students was um, went into manufacturing because uh, he wants to be able to get a high-paying job so that he can buy a house for his significant other and for his mother because his mother has housing insecurity. And this young man is gonna be able to do that with a career in manufacturing. Um, innovative pathways, uh, it's, it's amazing um, the pathways that you can take uh, through manufacturing. One of the things I think that's important for everybody to know is that education doesn't stop when you get a job in manufacturing. In fact, I'll tell you, I think it ramps up. Um, so if you're going through, anybody that's going through uh, any kind of pathway program that is interested in a career in manufacturing, um, there's many opportunities, many places for people to go. The smaller the company, the better the opportunities, because in a smaller company, it's next person up, right? And so it's, you know, if there's a job to be done, it's like, hey, you know, we have something over here. Do you want to learn how to do this? And if you say yes, um, you're going to have some great opportunities to learn and grow. And then there's tremendous advancement opportunities. You know, there are um, stories of, you know, listening to Ari Santiago uh, Made in America podcast this morning and um, the, the person that he had on is the owner of a company and he started out there as just a, a, an engineer uh, and now he ends up, he's owning the company. So, uh, so there's tremendous advancement opportunities as well. And then if we take a look at what's happening in the future, um, it's a very, very exciting time to be involved in manufacturing in Connecticut. You know, some of the trends that we're going to start to see is that manufacturing leaders are becoming more proactive in recruiting and retaining talent. So we got to make sure that we keep the people that we have and then, you know, people are going to you're starting to see 
um, you know, Shannon talked a little bit about educator externships, right? We're starting to see manufacturers and um, teachers and our education system engaging more in understanding what's the right curriculum that we need to be building to be able to make sure that we're creating the work the workforce and through our education system that can walk right into a manufacturer and be productive. Um, we're having supply chain issues right now. If you take a look at you know, the state of manufacturing in Connecticut is that backlogs are an all time high. A lot of companies are on pace for record revenue years. And uh, but yet they're having supply chain issues with material and some component parts. And we're going to see those continue as long as we have some of the geopolitical conflicts that we have going on right now. Um, we're starting to see increased communication, collaboration, cooperation and coordination within the ecosystem. Um, you're starting to see people really break down silos and start to work together uh, to make sure that we're all achieving our objective, which is to continue to grow manufacturing and, and to supply um, and to create pathways for people to have life-changing careers. Uh, adoption of digital technologies, we really need to accelerate uh, some of the digital technologies that we have and the digital transformation and leaders like Stanley Black and Decker and other companies, CCAT is another one that are helping us do that as well. Uh, increased focus on cybersecurity and a really big one that we're going to start to see that if you get excited about is clean energy. So there's a huge wind farm that's going off and you're starting to look at hydrogen and battery powered uh, energy and, and the storage of that energy are some exciting trends that are happening and we'll start to see those in the supply chain here in Connecticut. So as I said, I tell manufacturers uh, that we need to be using 100% of our resources here in Connecticut to make sure that we are uh, meeting our workforce needs and meeting the workforce demands. Uh, and we're starting to see more manufacturers come to the table through regional sector partnerships and other avenues um, to really make sure that we're creating the right environment for people to come to work uh, and for people to stay at work. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have, we have about three minutes for questions, but um, and I would open the floor now if anybody wants to quickly get a question in. Otherwise, I think everybody, uh, Shannon and Paul, I don't know, Marty, maybe you could share your um, email in the chat. So if anybody wants to get in touch with people um, following the session, please feel free. The slides will be shared with everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess we have, I guess we have time for one. So we, I just want to make a, I just want to make a point. Paul, okay. Paul, Paul touched on Connecticut's high cost, high labor cost state. And I think as it relates to advanced manufacturing, this is going to be an advantage because jobs left Connecticut after the second world war and went to the Carolinas because the hands were cheaper in the Carolinas than Connecticut. They left, they left the Carolinas in the 1980s and went to Mexico because the hands were cheaper in Mexico. In 2000, they went to China, the hands were cheaper. But now manufacturing is done with the head, not the hands. People are using technology and machines and automation and robotics. So high education, uh, smart places are gonna win in the future. And I think Connecticut is in a really good spot to grow its manufacturing sector because of its of its skills around knowledge. Great. Well said, Marty. So I well just said, uh, yeah. I was just informed that we can we can go until one fifteen. So if you guys I don't know what your schedule is, you're my panelists, but if there are any other questions, um, I was going to ask a question. This is Josh. I know we send a lot of people. Hi, Josh. How are you? Hi, <laughs> and especially I know people, um, and as Marty and Paul were saying as well during the COVID especially the pandemic um, down here in Norwalk, we were sitting on a lot of our clients that got employment, you know, more towards North Haven, um, you know, Amazon, those uh, different uh, location manufacturing jobs. How do we get um, this involvement down here? Michelle, if I'm asking the right question, if I could, you know, because this is something that um, I would love to get uh, involved here at the FOC. We have, in the manufacturing field, we have, you know, placed over a hundred people in jobs and I'm just quoting low over the past two years. And, not trying to, you know, toot our horn or nothing like that, but this is something I would love um, to start down here. Yeah. No, that was exactly um, uh, my question, Josh, is what about Fairfield County and how do we get, um, <clears throat> you know, more traction down here um, in, in this industry? There is, there is a regional sector partnership in manufacturing uh, hubbed out of Stanford that's working on this. Are you involved in that, Michelle or Josh? 
So I, I, I yeah, I, yeah, Paul, I mean, you want to connect them? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So it's um, so we have five regional sector partnerships around the state that are all based in manufacturing. They're all run by manufacturers. So the core group that's leading these are manufacturers, and they're supported by the workforce boards and the chambers of commerce uh, in that area. And they come up with strategic objectives of uh, of what they need in the manufacturing sector. And of course, workforce development is always number one. Um, so they look at what programs are available and how those programs are available in Fairfield County. There is a lot of work going on around manufacturing in Fairfield County. It's just, it, it's one of these things where, um, and this is again, a big part of, of my role is to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and make sure that we're communicating and all of that. So my email is in the chat. If you reach out to me, I can connect you with that regional sector partnership because you should be engaged with them uh, because they, you know, the, the more, this is a situation where the more people we have, the better off it's going to be uh, because we have, you know, the more people we have rowing uh, the boat, the, the quicker we're going to achieve that. And then I think when you look at the K through 12 and the ready CT stuff and what Shannon's doing, I think, you know, Shannon and I met this week, I think she's only limited by, um, by, you know, the, the resources of really, does she have enough resources to be able to uh, expand, which is money and then staff, right? So, um, right. so, you know, the more successful she is, the more that will uh, um, will work to make sure that the state is supporting her efforts, because it's really that K through 12 pathways is the area that we really need to start uh, changing some hearts and minds around. Maine. Now, Paul, I don't know if that, uh, if, if quote me, uh, at the end of March, I believe, I think it was March 23rd or 25th, um, one of the, the boards you just mentioned, uh, it wasn't the chamber, but I think it was the workforce um, workforce Development Initiative for Manufacturers, they were coming up with a five-year comprehensive plan for manufacturing, basically. And they had they had reached out to us about for three of our employers that we dealt with, one being 4 Plus Granola, um, Chalk Talk Sports, um, some, some um, manufacturing company here in Norwalk. And I know they were coming up with a five-year plan. I don't know if we're involved uh, with them, but I would love to because they reached out to some of our employees. I'm trying to find the yeah. Um, if you can find that, I, I don't yeah. I don't know anything about that. Anybody that's doing a strategic plan on manufacturing, I'd be keenly aware because I'm doing one for the state. So, yeah. so I would like to know if someone's going to try to do one regionally that maybe it all fits together. This is the this is the let's make sure we're cooperating and collaborating and not going off and doing our own thing thing. So uh, so yeah. So if you come across that, please uh, please forward that to me. So. Sylvia, I have a question. <clears throat> this is Gary. Hey. Excuse me. Sorry, that was the that was the wrong one. Paul it was the Western Connecticut Council of Governments. Oh, for okay. the five-year yeah. regional comprehensive economic development. Okay, that, yep. that, that's good. All Sorry. right, the, uh, the okay. Western Cog is fine. They're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary, go ahead. You want to introduce your where, who you're associated with? Hi, I'm Gary Decker. I'm I'm with SVP. I'm a I'm also a leadership coach. So my question goes to. Paul mentioned the hearts and minds of the candidates trying and, and students. Shannon talked about the challenges on the student side and the parent side, maybe getting interest in coming into manufacturing. What's happening or what needs to happen on the leadership side on the hearts and minds front in terms of being open and welcoming and engaging to folks that maybe look, act and, and think even sometimes differently than the leaders are more accustomed to. Yeah, Gary, I'll I'll, um, I'll take this one because um, you and I had this conversation, which is great. So um, yeah, so when you look at workforce development and you start and we start to look at people that we're training to get into manufacturing, we really have to look at the leaders of these manufacturing organizations and get them to understand that the worker of today is very different. I, the, the, the people that we're training today to come into work in our manufacturing environment think and act differently than the people that we have that have been with, working with us for 40 years. And what we find is that if the cultures of these organizations don't change, then, then people are going to come into these organizations and they're not going to feel like they fit. So, so concurrently with working with students and guidance counselors and parents, we also need an initiative that also trains the leaders of these companies because you'll find that the companies that attract young people and they have very high retention rates of younger people and people in manufacturing have a very different work environment than some of the companies that are struggling. And that is, is that they're very much more inclusive. They're very much more communicative. They're very much more flexible. Um, you know, they have, uh, you know, younger people today have a much different relationship with time. Than, uh, than I would say some of the older people in that 
um, it's more fluid for them. They're never off. They're always on, you know, and it's never, and some of the times the manufacturing, people that are leading manufacturing businesses are the seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven mindset, right? That's what you're going to work. And that's, that's what you're, how you're going to work. So, um, so that's another kind of one of the another legs of the stool, Gary, that we need to look at is that, you know, I always said at Cary Manufacturing that the, the, in order to have a great culture, the biggest person that had to, the, the biggest change that had to be made was me. I needed to change. And once I did, it became easy for me to recruit and retain um, employees. So that's, that's another area that I think we need to look at as, as employers as well. So. If I can ask one more question, Paul, and I'll shut up. Um, I, I know Gary, Mark, Marty, excuse me, was talking about the, the second chance initiative, um, you know, and because it, and mind you, that's a big untapped potential that, you know, a lot of employers don't see. Uh, is there any, other ideas that you guys can share that you're doing that um, like maybe stopping at like the one stop shop reentry um, centers that's, you know, popping up in like Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, things like that. Is there going to be more like engaging with them to letting them know about these jobs? These yeah, so, Josh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big question that deserves a really big answer. And I don't think that we have it all figured out yet. We're getting, the right people around the table. What we're who we're aligning with is the NAACP on the million job commitment, and and really start to align all of those employers around this, okay. not just manufacturing, but how do we create an ecosystem where people can come into it, move around, get the right supports, and the other big strategy we're looking at is we believe that we first have to uh, build mindsets before we teach skill sets. Right. It's a really important notion because when you take somebody out of incarceration, they hit the halfway house, they come into a program, they may not know how to manage deferred gra gratification or triggers or right. stress or neighborhood or whatever. So we're working on all those things and we're working with people who have been through the system and are leading the way. I certainly, my, my input to this is not out front, it's to help them build the right system because I don't have the experience in the system. They do, they have the answers to. And that, and that was, and that was actually big, what you said, uh, Marty, because uh, the reason why I did ask that, because there are some programs that are around that are dealing more so when six months before they come out of incarceration, you know, they're getting to, right. and we're talking about that age limit, 23 and down 23, 22, you know, 18, 17, and we're trying to get more to the young people and they have been incarcerated already, but there's programs that, you know, they start working with them six months in advance before they right. get out. So when they do get out, you know, they're dealing with things of their trauma know, and, right. you know, getting the ID and getting housed and then, you know, they could possibly then come over and get landed in a, 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 a a good manufacturing job where they have a right. career now, you know, I oh, uh, Josh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, we, sorry. Kind of, yeah. I'm so Josh, sorry. Josh, I'll follow up is, with you, Josh. I'll follow yeah, up. Why don't you get in touch with Marty? I think yes, that thank you. Because awesome, we have awesome. pastors thank involved. You. we got all kinds of people getting involved. You yeah, know. and I, I just wanted to, there, there was a question in the chat um, and we're mm -hmm. coming to the end here. Are there any trainings being done in other languages? This is, comes from Thomas Olivo. Um, and are there any efforts to address some of the barriers that our workforce is facing, such as childcare, transportation, et cetera? Um, who wants so to I will, I'll talk a little bit about childcare and transportation. So in the budget that the governor signed yesterday, there's $100 million for childcare. So um, that will be going towards childcare. It's a recognition by the governor that uh, there are people that are not working that could be working, but because of some of these barriers. Um, so they're uh, the legislature and the governor have sent uh, set $100 million aside to uh, help support child care, and there's some other child care initiatives. And then we're looking at transportation. I think we're looking at some more creative ways to be able to provide uh, transportation to folks. You know, as, as I say, the, the world's largest transportation company doesn't own a car. So it's called Uber and Lyft. So, you know, how do we you know, how do we leverage the world's largest transportation company to get people back and forth to work? And I know at Carry Manufacturing, that was um, that was one of the things that we did to help people get back and forth to work was to really help kind of subsidize uh, the transportation using some of those vehicles. Um, and as far as training in other languages, uh, Shannon, I don't know if that's um, something you might be able to address. I'm not aware of any of that. Yeah, I would just say um, in our we're, in our work again, we're we're very um, 
at, at the scale we're at right now, we're, we're very thoughtful about the hiring we do. So whenever we're bringing someone in who's embedded within a school supporting a pathway, we do um, look for individuals who speak a second language, Spanish being the most prominent. Um, and on our team, 50% of our team are Spanish speaking as well as we have two people who speak Portuguese. Um, so we're trying to be available for students in particular, where we know that English could be, uh, being an English learner could be a barrier, as well as communicating with their parents and families. Um, but we're never gonna be able to speak all the languages. I mean, it's a, we're a very language rich um, state. So we do access uh, language translation services for all of our flyers and other documents that we put out into the world. And there is kind of a just-in-time translation service that we can access as we need, but we don't deliver like a full comprehensive training typically in, a, in another language because uh, we're, we're also aligning with kind of the school expectations around, uh, around um, language acquisition. So we, we work very closely with the school partners. Um, but I do know that for adult workers, there are lots of opportunities out there offered, uh, especially through uh, the workforce uh, investment boards. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, panelists. You were fabulous. Thank you for staying it's this extra time and giving people a, an opportunity to um, to ask questions. Um, this was this was wonderful. And um, hopefully you'll be hearing from all these people who couldn't ask questions on the, on the panel. So uh, have a great day, guys. Thanks again.